Good morning and welcome to. Uh, okay, that is bad. There we go, that's better. Good morning again and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we are a webinar and we don't mind if you call us that. Um, some people have issues with that. Um, we that term. Um, we are here um, live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show and post it to our website afterwards in an archive. And I'll show you at the end of today's show uh, where you can find all of our archives. Um, we post a recording of the show. It goes up to our Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube account. Um, if there's a presentation, as there is in here, we share that on our SlideShare account. Um, and if there's any um, interesting links, um, there's sometimes within the presentation, as I know they are today, um, but sometimes we'll post them as well for you. So um, everything you need will be there in the recording afterwards. Um, both our live show and our recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your colleagues, uh, friends, neighbors, family, anybody who you think might be interested in any of our topics that we have on the show, they're welcome to join us live or um, hop to our website and check out our recordings. Uh, we do have our archives going back to the very beginning of the show, which was in January of 2009. So you will find some um, out of date information in there, we'll call it historical. There you go, for historical purposes. <laughs> for historical, but yes, we are librarians, so we archive and save everything. So um, do keep that in mind if you are looking at our archives, looking at some old shows. Um, they're all dated, so you can't miss the fact that something happened in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, whenever. Okay. Um, but we do keep everything out there, just like I said, for historical purposes. Um, the focus of our show, the only real criteria for the show is that it's something library related. We do a mixture of things here. We do book reviews, interviews, uh, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Uh, but our, and our, the only limit on that is that it's something library related. Any type of libraries, public, academic, school, um, special, museums, uh, we're pretty broad just that it's folks in libraries. Uh, some of our topics, you may look at a title and say, libraries really? No, really, um, that I always make sure everything comes from the libraries in the end, no matter what our topic is. So trust me on that <laughs> if you're not sure. Um, we do have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do um, presentations here for things that are um, specific to what we're doing here at, this, at the Library Commission uh, program services that we offer. But we also bring in guest speakers. And this morning we have a guest speaker. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, Scott. <laughs> a free well, guest. Yes. Well, no, <laughs> that's a, well uh, Scott Childers is the director of our Southeast Library System, which is a um, here in Nebraska. For those of you not aware, we have four regional library systems, um, just based geographically, mm -hmm. and they do consulting and training for libraries in their area, and they are um, funded by the, through the Library Commission. So. He's a guest speaker because his office is on the other side of Lincoln, um, but he's also connected to the commission, so you're a little both. There we go. <laughs> yeah. And um, he's a person who's here about fair use. Um, fair use, copyright, things that make some people cringe, um, <laughs> me included. <laughs> but hopefully we'll um, get you up to speed on what it is and how you can and or can't um, use it in your library. Um, so I'll just hand it over to you, Scott. Take it away. Okay. Take it away. Thanks. It's all about it. Thanks. Um, one thing I do want to stress is if this type of presentation, the way I present it, uh, your questions are important. So definitely use that Q&A box that, that Chris, Krista said earlier, and we'll try to get to them as we go along. Yeah, sure. Uh, because yeah, type it any time you want to ask, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of our stuff tends to, to build on previous. And if you don't get some of the earlier stuff, you might get a little lost in the last. So please, mm -hmm. you know, if you got a question, put it in there. If I notice something that I will get to, we'll let you know. Um, yeah, we'll try need, not to leave you hanging. Yeah, if you need something clarified as it's as it's you talking about it, say something then. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're going to talk about fair use. And to do that, we'll have to talk about copyright. And some of you may have already had some, some experience with copyright and fair use trainings. Um, but I'll, I'm going to start kind of from the basics. So we're all on the same page. 
because that is important to, to understand how fair use works and how some of the other things work, is to understand how copyright is set up. Uh, I do want to put out a couple of disclaimers. One, this is kind of time sensitive because copyright laws could change in the future. So if you're watching this 10 years from now, yeah. Hopefully find, things are different. Find a different podcast. And two, I am not a lawyer. None of today should be construed as official legal advice. Uh, this is guidelines on how this has worked in the past, observations, but it's not, I wouldn't go to a court case just from saying, I, I attended a one hour webinar. So. And they said it was okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you tell I have folks in the legal profession in my family? <laughs> right. They taught you well. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start with what is copyright. Uh, so this is U.S. law. This is uh, something that's been put in place so that way people who have ideas could earn a living off of those ideas. Same reason we have patents. Um, different countries have different copyright law. So if you're an international uh, attendee, your experience may vary. Um, I don't think we have anyone signed up today outside of the no, U.S. No, so we're good. No. Um, but it is, it is there so when people can earn a living off of ideas creatively, art, uh, writing, music, those type of things. Copyright allows people to, or gives people more protection so they can earn a living doing art and humanity. So it is important. Um, oftentimes people think of copyright as big business and it, it, it has turned out that way. But initially it is to protect um, creative endeavors. Okay, and it's about ideas. Um, so let's talk about the rights. Uh, often people think copyright is one big monolithic thing. I have copyright. It's not, it's a collection of things that you could do with your idea. One is reproduce. So let's say I write a story and I have copyright. Therefore, I could make copies of that story freely and, and you know, it is my right to do so. I can adapt. I can take that story and turn it into a comic strip or a musical or interpretive dance, whatever. You know, I have that right as a copyright holder to adapt it into a different type of format. I can perform it. I can take that story and do a reading. I can take that musical and sing the song. I have that right with this idea, this expression uh, to do so. I can distribute. I can take those copies and I can hand them out. I can also sell those copies. So I can go to Chris and say, here, it's my short story. Or I can say, here, I'll sell this to you for 50 cents. <laughs> now whether she'll buy it for 50 cents, I don't know. But it's my right to do so. And now here's another important thing. I have the right to license it to someone else. So Krista could come to me and say, hey, I love your story. I'd like to turn it into a web comic. I could say, yes, we'll work this out and I will give you the right to my original story to adapt it to somewhere else. So I could lend one of those rights, whether for free or for pay. Right, we might work out some sort of a uh, profit sharing yeah, deal. Yeah, exactly. It could be a one-time fee, it could be a continuous profit sharing, it could be for short term. It could be, you could do this, but you don't, you don't get to host it anywhere else but this website, and we earn co, you know, we earn equal share of the advertising. That could be a deal we worked out. So publishing, you know, if I write a book and I'm going to sell that book to a publisher, I'm selling the rights and then they are doing that. And oftentimes in those deals, you are permanently transferring your rights to that, that publishing house. I no longer have those rights because I have sold them all. Some authors are doing things differently now. Uh, Hugh Howley, I think, is the guy. He did ebooks, self-published. They made it big. Publishing house said we'd like to do a print version, so he said, "Yeah, you could do a print version, but I still get all the ebook e rights. You can't do an ebook. I'll give you the rights to do a publishing version." Yeah. So you can pick and choose and do these things. Uh, this allows us things like Creative Commons, yeah. because you can if I, I don't know. Uh, previously, you probably talked about Creative Commons in a previous episode. Someone. Oh, well, oh, in the past we have had discussions in, in the archives. Think about it, yeah. But there there, people who own the copyright can say, I freely let you do that, do this. I freely let you make copies. I freely let you uh, 
perform it, but you can't pay. You can't force people to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? So it is something that is negotiated. Questions so far uh, on this concept? So copyright is not one big monolithic block. Yeah, it is. It has different levels and different things you have to think about when you're when you are creating something and want to copyright it. These mm -hmm. are the things you have to decide. Yeah. Um, and it says Creative Commons. We have done sessions on that before on Encompass Live, so check our archives. Um, it's nice that it does guide you very nicely, I think, through these different things you might want to think about because there are different types of Creative Commons licenses you can choose, and they explain these kind of things to you in there as well. Yeah. Which is nice. Yeah, so and, and these, this type of structure also lets us have some fair use and some classroom exceptions. Mm -hmm. So it's something to think about that because we have things broken down and made it really complex, it gives us freedom to do other things. So let's talk about who gets the copyright. Again, in current US law, it is the creator automatically unless it's being done for work is higher. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And it is issued automatically once it's put into a fixed form. Uh, and registering is optional now. You do not have to send a copy to a copyright office in uh, DC to have copyright. So a blog post, you're writing your personal blog on your top, your own time, bingo, you've copyrighted that that post. You've composed a song, recorded it, you owe copyright to that original uh, composition in that original performance. Right? You do not have to register it. Like make it official in some way. Right. Now, it helps if there's ever a court case because then you have all of this, I don't want to say unquestionable documentation, but really sturdy documentation. Mm -hmm. And if you do it early on, so I fixed it in this, this form. I wrote the book, I published the piece, I recorded the music, I sent it off within the first you know, few months. Then it's really it gives you that time stamp. Okay, so that's what I was gonna say. Documents when it when you actually did it. If anyone else decides to uh, question if you did or right. think that they may may created the work or yeah yeah. And um, I, were you gonna ask? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I was just noticing. I assume we're going to go into defining what fixed form is because it oh. is in quotes. Yeah, well, what is, that, what is meant by that comes from the, the, the statute itself, the ah, fixed okay. form. But um, so, blog post, the word document, the rented word, the recording of the song, uh, those type of things, the script for a play. You know, it once it's out of the head, if it's still up here, it's not copyright. No. You have to show, be able to hand someone something and say, This is. This is my work. Mm -hmm. um, I do also wanted to talk about there have been some people who suggest a poor man's copyright, and that air quotes, mm -hmm. um, which you take your work, you put it in an envelope, and mail it to yourself, and then you use the postmark as the copyright uh -huh. date. Mm -hmm. Now, that that really does not have much weight in a courtroom, mm -hmm. especially since we've already got um, this fixed form. And if you can show it's distributed in any other manner, this poor man's copyright registration doesn't matter. It's kind of unnecessary. And really registering for copyright is not that expensive compared to what a court case might be if you wanted to fight. So really you're not you're not gaining any protections by doing that method. Um, and I've actually seen that in writing books. Uh, yes, where they recommend they, that? they recommend throwing it in an envelope and mail it to yourself. It puts a stamp on something, but really it's no additional protection. Okay. All right, so that's copyright in a nutshell. Uh, before I move into educational use, and I know we've got educators on the line here. Um, we have both school and university. Excellent. So this is going to be geared mainly for you, the public librarians. Uh, some of this will apply, some of it will not. But keep that in, hang on, we'll get to, to more general stuff later. Again, if you have a question, please let us know. But educational use, there is something actually in copyright law for educational use. It's written in, in there. It's not fair use. It's something specifically. Yeah. Um, and what this does, it gives you the ability to use copyright material in a classroom setting, however much of it you want, 
for you know so you can use a whole movie without paying for licenses or anything like that if you follow these specific rules and again this is classroom use exception to qualify you must one be in a classroom and the codes are or similar place devoted to instruction so the classroom that's no question the school library or school media center that might be questionable depending if you normally have a class in that room or not mm -hmm. uh, the school gymnasium probably harder to defend um, I've seen some people ask well it's in a school so that's a place devoted to instruction the entire building the, the entire, entire building places right um, I, I I really don't have a strong answer for that type of defense. I don't know if. Like, what if you are taking, I, I mean, I would say field trip, but you've mm -hmm. taken them outside of the school somewhere else to teach for some reason, like gone, um, you know, offsite to like the high school went to the university because there was something there that they wanted to use as well, and then they're using it in that yes. place. Or, well, okay, that's a classroom as well. Yeah, actually. and so those are those Some, type of, yeah. and those things, that gets pretty nuanced. It does, it's not black or white in that case. Mm -hmm. But, um, so if you're thinking of the traditional classroom setting that you're in, that the students are in, that mm -hmm. is pretty cut dry. But yeah. everything else, you start veering off into interpretations. Right, how and, much does, what does it mean to be devoted to yeah. instruction? Yeah. How much time does it need to be? Then they, of course, are not defined that, I assume. No. no that, is, <laughs> that is the full uh, definition. Pardon me. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the second thing, the instructor has to be there in person, engaged in face-to-face -face teaching activities. So you can't just show the movie and say, OK, class dismissed. There has to be something going on, whether you're talking about hey, this movie took place in the 1950s, was filmed in the 1970s. What does that say to us now in 2017? Um, this music was the first of its kind, but now it sounds kind of the same of everything else now. Well, let's talk about how it was revolutionary at that time. Um, this, this TV show, you know, was highly relevant in the 80s. Now, most of their references are lost on us. What can we, what can we learn from this? Mm -hmm. um, so you can do the culture, the history, the artistic merits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an art class is watching the video of Bob Ross to decide is this or is this not worth learning, you know. <laughs> but you're doing something with that copyrighted material. Mm -hmm. um, and something so, that has to do with the curriculum. Yes. So it can't just be, I'm the student teacher, or I'm the um, substitute teacher for the day, and this is just a keeping the students Keep entertained for this session because I'm not here to, I don't, I'm not here to actually teach anything. Exactly. They're, they're <laughs> for entertainment happy. purposes, it is not allowed. Right, and it's not a babysitter. Yes, yeah, babysitting, that. that's. It, it, there has to be some reason you are showing this. Mm -hmm. So, third, you're using a legally acquired copy of the work in question. It does not say it has to be that the school legally acquired it. It could from what my interpretation is, it could be from the teacher's personal collection. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker, it's a physical media. Streaming, digital does not count in this exception as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. This was written well before. The thing is, some of this, I, I, copyright class, this needs to be updated. There's, mm -hmm. there's so many, uh, there's some of the second bullet there, being there in person, engaged in face-to-face -face teaching. There's so much teaching now that is, done remotely and we'll talk about remote and yeah. like through things like moodle or blackboard or um your face to face but online face to face like we are right now I, we have a camera if you did you could all if you were participating in a meeting like this you have a camera we're not in the same room yeah. but it is real time and we are face to face yeah and we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about distance learning in a little bit yeah and then um and then you have to be at a nonprofit educational institution. So if you're at a for-profit educational institution, this classroom exception is not for you. Okay, so those are your four bullet points in law that allows a classroom to use copyrighted material. Now here's the here's the thing: there are companies out there that are trying to scare people, scare educators, and say, "Well, you need to have a license to show these movies." But if you scroll down in the website in the fine print, it says for recreational purposes. Educational purposes are covered by classroom. 
so, but their text did not even hint that this exception exists. It's written very cleverly mm -hmm. to, to make you frightened. And to make you pay some sort of fee to them. That's it, what they're looking for. Even though you don't need that in a classroom setting, right? right? So we talked about this learning. Teach Act of 2002 hey. added that. Um, expanded those same exceptions only to a distance learning. The access has to be limited to just the students in the class. So you can't just have it on the website anywhere. A place you have to log into. Exactly. Yeah. Password protected, that type of thing. And only for the length of the class. So the, the students can't come back after the class to watch that video, listen to that music clip, uh, hear that performance, see that whatever. And another thing about this is copyright information must be provided in this case. And this is the, hey, don't be a pirate type of copyright thing. You have to have some statements about this is copyright material. You can't copy it. You can't share it. Right. You can't share your password. Students, you can't download this and then use it for your own recreational use. Yes. If it's a, you know, this movie that we are studying in class. Mm -hmm. and you yeah. can't download it. You have to view it in the course management system or right. whatever. So. so they can't even have the ability to do that, which most is course management. That's how you work. You yeah. log into them and that's how you get access to everything. Yeah. So, so that's classroom use exception, and these are written into law. You have these these things. So again, they're already out there covering you what you need to do in these situations. Yep. yep. And again, there are companies out there that will be that are trying to push this need for licenses for classroom use, but if you read the fine print, it says for the recreational or or, or that type of thing. If it's for the classroom in those educational things and you have activities with that material, then you're, you're good. You don't even have to worry about fair use because you have law. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's any more questions. Any questions about classroom use? I do have something on recording pro programs. Um, I, I don't think there's too many that do recording now because there's so much available like on the network's own websites and stuff. Right. Yeah. There are not laws on this. These are best practices based off of court law and some discussions with intellectual property folks back in the day. Um, so you could record a broadcast to show in your classroom, but it has to be something that's publicly broadcast. So pay channels can't be taped and brought in according to these guidelines. Um, and this is strictly the recording bit. If you happen to be in a in a school that has cable television and there's a TV bro pro uh, broadcast happening mm -hmm. at the time that you need it to happen, you should be good. This is simply the recording bit. Uh, these, so this is recording it yourself for you to then use. Yes. So now with a lot of, I think pretty much every cable company, they have on demand for yeah. a lot of their programs. That would be included now in if this, the school has cable, Anything that's in the live shows and on demand as part of their package should be able to be used too. And, and that's one of those great areas. That's so new they still haven't. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those great areas. Yeah, where, where I, have, I haven't seen any real precedents yet. Mm -hmm. um, now, this there are lawsuits, multiple copyright lawsuits every hour. So it's quite possible I missed some precedent. If any of you ha happen, uh, to come across one, I'd love to hear about it. Um, but I do know there are some school libraries that still have a massive collection of recorded things from PBS, you know, mm -hmm. back in the 80s. Um, according to the best guidelines, they suggest that after 45 days that tape is destroyed. Um, and it had only been kept to decide if you're going to purchase a commercial recording of it. Now, again, these are guidelines, they're not the law, there's no copyright police. No. Period. Let alone one that's going to come to the classroom and raid your shelves. Um, however, if you're looking for an excuse to clean those out, this, there's a good way. <laughs> um, I've, I've been in some schools where there's a faculty member says, "I might possibly need those, even though there's dust and it's thick on them." You can say, "You know, best practice says 45 days." And this is recorded in 1985, so we're going to get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> Besides the fact that it was recorded in 1985, you probably want something newer, unless you're doing something historical. But, you know. Yeah, so so that's recording. Okay, it, again, that classroom exception is in copyright statute. 
And so you educators uh, who are listening, you've got that in your back pocket already. Fair use gives us some other things that we can consider. This is uh, for your public librarians. You can, you can wake up now. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about fair use. And this is, I'll be honest, I talk about fair use a little differently than some, some other people. Uh, because some people treat fair use as a checklist. One, two, three, four, I'm good. Fair use is not that, technically. Fair use is a doctrine that, that promotes free expression of using parts of copyright material without permission and without pay, but it is a courtroom defense. It is not a preemptive checklist. That is something to think about. You could do everything right and follow those four things and still get hit with a copyright lawsuit. Like I said, there's no copyright cops, right? It's all done through lawsuits. You'll get cease and desist. Uh, you may get a letter, or you may get, in the end, maybe a court case. What there is is there's the person who owns the copyright finds out that you're using something, and that's where the um, conflict comes from. Right. Where the, you know, yeah. Right. But you cannot preemptively say, I claim fair use on this. No, that, that type of disclaimer has no weight. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this on YouTube, but I see it. People will post something. And yeah, I, I look for these types of things on YouTube because I'm kind of weird that way. <laughs> uh, I look for examples of things people are doing wrong. Uh, they'll put underneath, they'll, they'll upload an episode of a TV show. They'll upload, upload a sporting event. I'd say content copyright of ABC or ESPN or this Disney. This is not my work. It, I just it's from them. Yeah. It's not my work. I claim no copyright. Uh, no, no material. That's just words. It does not. You'll still get hit with a DMCA if the copyright owners notice. Mm -hmm. And people ask, well, why is that stuff still up there? It's because no one has noticed yet. Oh yeah. Or it's. I mean, and it's going to vary from copyright holder to copyright holder too. Mm -hmm. If they think, if they care, if it matters to them that you've shared this, uh -huh. and that's going to vary too. Some, depending on what it is you're sharing and who it is you shared it from, some places are like, "Yeah, it was just some little quickie thing that we did. We don't care," and it's not imposed. I think part of their thinking of a copyright holder is, is it? Um, Infringing on me making money off of what I created, mm -hmm. or ABC is this, is it infringing on my company making money? You know, are people watching this, and that's where the money's being made, rather than they should be coming to me. Yeah. And hopefully, they will look at that and decide that has zero effect on us, so we really don't care. <laughs> it's not worth our lawyer's um, time. That's the, exactly. So that's why too, some of these things we'll say up there is they've looked at it and said not worth our time to even fight this one because it's just. Yeah. Nothing. It has no effect on us. Yeah. And, and talking about YouTube briefly, um, they have some automated checkers. And it's usually used in the music area, but they will pull down mm -hmm. um, videos. And that's why you'll sometimes see uh, clips that have been mirrored mm -hmm. or sped up, slowed down, mm -hmm. boxed. Um, I'll see this. People will take the recording. And then put a kind of a, a frame around it and upload that. So it was like you know, classic television, blah blah blah. And then the, you know, and the size of a postage stamp is the actual TV episode. They're trying to fool those automated uh, copyright checkers. Whether or not that works, it's a that's up to debate. <laughs> but anyway, all of them are thinking fair use. I could do this because I'm not making money. That's not exactly. Uh, defense. Let's talk about it though. Um, there are four, four use, fair use factors that judges will use to decide. And it is the judges who will decide, not you, not the intellectual property owner. Mm -hmm. One is the purpose and character of your work. Are you doing something new with it? Are you doing something transformative? Mm -hmm. Are you creating new art, new understanding, new knowledge with this? Um, so, did I just take Harry Potter and change the name from Harry Potter to Larry Sodder? You know, that, okay, that's even probably plagiarism too. But <laughs> I didn't change anything of the meaning of the story or anything like that. I just changed the names with a find and replace. 
you know, that type of use, definitely, no. Um, now, am I doing a critique of, say, a Harry Potter movie? That's different. I'm creating new knowledge, new understanding, new types of commu communicating ideas. So that's a different type of use. Um, and the character my use might be different. I'm pointing out specific parts of the plot or the effects or the makeup or the costuming. Or, hey, look at this and look at this picture from medieval England of the, of the buildings, mm -hmm. right? How are they different? How are they more fanciful in one or the other? Right, so that is, what are you using this for? Okay. Uh, two is the nature of the work itself. Um, I'm going to use encyclopedias as an example. Encyclopedias are full of facts. You cannot copyright facts. And this a court case happened not too long ago. Major League Baseball was suing a, I believe it was a fantasy baseball website, maybe it was a magazine saying that you can't put the box scores of our games in your in your product. You, you. Okay. It went to court <laughs> and the, the, the court said it's the batter went one for three that night. The pitcher pitched these, this number of pitches. Mm -hmm. There was this number in attendance. All of those are factual information. You, you did not create the they are made, Hopefully they're not made up. <laughs> you did not create the fact that the score was seven to three. That was not a um, artistic thing. It was the result of a ball game. So therefore you could not copyright those facts. Now, however, the television broadcast, the radio broadcast, the newspaper articles about that game, those could all be copyrighted. Because then people were commenting and creating most likely their own. That was a great hit by the batter, and that's my opinion, and here's how I thought it went. And yeah, let's just, when they do the analysis for, you know, an hour after the game. <laughs> exactly. They're taking those facts, and they're creating new knowledge, or they're creating a new, sometimes they're creating a new story to build up to some mm -hmm. other thing that they're, it's like, hey, this one, this one picture is our hometown hero. So we're really going to focus on that pitcher's history, right? You know, here in Nebraska, Alex Gordon is going to take up a good chunk of the Royals coverage uh, as opposed to some of the other players because he has a history with this state. Um, you know, I go back home a few years ago. They had a local kid playing on the Nebraska Husker football team. So it was, all over the news. If he, news. If he made something, they'd emphasize that part too, right? So the nature of the, the work, so you could, you know, encyclopedias, back to that thing, the facts in the encyclopedias, that's fair game, but the write-ups, how they expressed those facts, that is copywritten. Okay? Okay. Third is the amount and substantiality of the portion taken. I'm going to ask a question. Some of you who have heard fair use things, there's usually a number thrown around for this. Anyone want to? Share that number with me. See, I want to see kind of how, how yeah, widespread. What do you think the amount is? Go ahead and type into your uh, the question section. Your go to yeah. webinar. Yeah. And I, while we're waiting a bit, I actually missed something on work for hire and copyright. I'll cover that at the end. Okay. So we'll get back to work for hire. Sorry about that. I got so excited about fair use and educational <laughs> use. Anybody have an idea how much of that you can use in from a copyrighted work? Nobody has any clue. Okay. <laughs> do, do you have a? a oh, geez. Um, so we're talking about what is the maximum amount you can use? Is that the question? Yeah, um, that's the question. That I'll say twenty percent or less. That, that's more than I've heard in some. Okay, I've, heard some people, <laughs> I've heard some people say 10. 10 yeah. That seems to be what I've heard a lot of, of presenters talk about 10. Hmm. And I, I'm going to tell you. Or is it, is it a, well, yeah. But go ahead. Depends on how big the work is, how much you're going to take. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good thought. Yeah. Or how much you could take. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, here's the thing. That was a trick question. There is none. It, it, it doesn't <laughs> matter. There have been lawsuits on three seconds of a five minute song mm -hmm. because it was a very identifiable part of that song. Sure. And it got used in a sampling bit 
and there was a lawsuit, and the, the intellectual property owner won. And just recently, last week, there was a, a suit between two YouTube channel owners. Uh, I can't remember how you pronounce it. H three H three was one of them, but the other was some some guy saying how he picked up chicks or something. I'm not going to link to either one of them to tell you the truth, but they went to court against each other. One YouTube channel used three minutes of a five minute video clip from the other, and they were told, "Yeah, that's very useful. What you did is fair is is okay. The, the intellectual property owner does not have a case against you." And they won that case. So it's because of what they did with that three minutes. Exactly. Not that it was three minutes long. Exactly. But what they were using and the purpose played into into the uh, into the case. The amount and substantiality is not necessarily a de um, determining factor by itself, but it could come into play with some of the others. And I've heard that ten percent thumbnail thrown around for years, and it's not that. It's how is it used. And what parts did you use? Did you give away a big reveal? Mm -hmm. You know, that could be five seconds of a movie, a whole yeah. movie, but you gave it away in your spo in a spoiler thing. Maybe someone has a claim. So this was the whole part of the movie. The whole point of making this movie was that bit. Yeah. yeah. So it's not just the amount, it's the bits that you took. And then the last we talked about earlier is the effect mm -hmm. on the market. Mm -hmm. Are people going to make money off of this? Yeah. And here's the thing, it's not just in the same medium that it's currently printed in or, or created in. So if I have a book and someone creates a web, a web comic based on that book, that's still affecting my ability to enter that market, True. to possibly make money in that market. So it doesn't have to be book for book, web, web comic for web comic, music for music. Um, it's any market. And so that will also come into play. And these, all, all four of these, they, go ahead. You can see how they would work together, because you're talking about giving away something in, in a movie or a book or something mm -hmm. that a copyright holder can get upset at you with that and say, you shouldn't have done that. You've ruined my entire income from based off of this work. But then when you take into account the effect on that work's potential market, for example, um, Darth Vader is Luke's father. Oh, now you just spoil it for me. Right. <laughs> Star Wars, L Lucas isn't going to come after me for that now because it's been so many years. Hopefully everybody knows. <laughs> everybody who's watching knows. However, if that had been something that, and, you know, a week after the movie came out, that could be something potentially that they would say, you can't because now people won't go see the movie. But here's, here's the thing, though. It could be balanced off of a critique. And critiques... <sighs> Are given more fair use, right? Right. It, it's not like I'm spoiling it. Just like they're saying, the fact that they did this in the movie and said that he was was good, bad, and why, and this is why I think why I right. should have done it, and shouldn't have done it, and my evaluation of the movie as a whole, blah blah blah, blah et, cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So these four uses are, play off of each other, and your specific use case may depend more or less on any one of these. Um, so and, and these factors aren't in law, right? These come from precedents in court cases mainly. And we have so much court case, uh, case law over the years that that has defined kind of where the fair use parameters are. Mm -hmm. Fair use is not in copyright law as far as this, okay? This type of detail comes from, these are what people, what judges will look at mm -hmm. in a court case. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Is this something that, and I'm going to ask your opinion, you guys, not being a lawyer. I am not a lawyer. There we go. Do Disclaimer. you think this should be somehow made into law so that people can have a cut and dry like copyright? Or is it better to have it? A new court case may change what? Here, there's a couple things. Uh, if we put it into law, then what happens when new tech comes in that disrupts? Just like everything, yeah. Right? Yeah. And if it's court case precedent, then that allows those weird things to come in and help define the future, mm -hmm. whereas waiting for an actual legislative action mm -hmm. um, could th 
could have some problems. Also, lobbying affects legislation so much more in this day and age than in a court case. Uh, companies can certainly put in amicus briefs. They're probably the ones going to court saying, hey, this is our copyright material. But lobbying affects laws at this point, and there's a lot of money to be had on preventing some fair uses. Now, I'm not saying all intellectual property owners are, are, are greedy such and no, such. I'm not saying that. But it's probably it's better to keep doing this on a case by case basis to um, or get more organically create these how things should be done, these guidelines. That's kind of where I'm at at this point. Real life will will determine what your isn't isn't allowed, mm -hmm. rather than some law that was written 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. We'll we'll see how the future goes. But right now, I think this using the precedents from previous court cases has actually come up with four fairly easily understandable things that. And, and I, again, I don't want to say this is a checklist. However, if you were following these type of guidelines, mm -hmm. it makes a suit against you less attractive. Take these into consideration and think about what you would say in response to these four things mm -hmm. if some copyright holder or company did come to you and say, hey, no. And you can say, well, here's our, here's our evaluation of what we did, mm -hmm. our opinion of it, and how we met these and um, thought that we did think about it. We didn't just go willy-nilly and just do this without knowing that there was something we had to think about and plan for. Yeah, yeah, so, while it's not a checklist, it's certainly things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of things courts will be looking at. Yes, the judges, and, and, and like I said, the, the court case I was just talking about with the two YouTube Yeah, I channels, saw stuff about that online. These four factors, can, you can get the actual, uh, maybe I should get you a, a link to the actual if you want to see the court decision, all 21 pages in full legal ease. <laughs> okay, maybe I'm the only one, but it's out there. Uh, sure, other people. Yeah, it's available sure. out there. And so are other uh, court case copyright type things. Okay. Um, take a quick pause here for, for yeah, questions. Anybody have any questions? Anything that you are wondering about that you have, um, have used and you're wondering about one or more, but if you think it met the right these factors, um, um, anything you're thinking about using, you want to check and see if you think it would be okay. Um, you know, give us an example of something that you've either done or are thinking about doing, so we can maybe. Uh, uh, while we're waiting for that, let me touch on that work for hire bit that I skipped mm -hmm. real, real briefly. Um, so I talked about who gets copyright; it's the creator. However, if it's being done as a part of your job or you're getting paid for it through a contract or some sort of agreement, then that copyright goes with your boss, or not your boss, your company, your the organization. The organization. Mm -hmm. So for example, this episode right here, right now, even though Krista and I are, are making it up on the fly yeah, in front of your faces, mm -hmm. this is probably commission copyright because it's being done on the clock. Sure. <laughs> That it, 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 that's you know that's just a real quick off the top of my head thinking of it. Uh, I could ponder and go back and say, well, I created the slideshow before I got here, so maybe that part is my bit, and I'm licensing that to the commission. Mm -hmm. You know, these type of things, it, it, there are court cases on this that happen a lot too. Mm -hmm. So, and what we actually have done here at the commission, we have thought about this, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, being that we're kind of an educate an open educational institution in, uh, organization, mm -hmm. sort of. I mean, that's kind of a vague. Um, we have attempted to, wherever we can, uh, use Creative Commons licensing on okay. things. Now, um, for example, and I'm just looking down here, and you'll see it if you look yourself on our YouTube videos themselves. Mm -hmm. YouTube actually does let you choose a license for your videos mm -hmm. um, within the YouTube system, and we chose Creative Commons. Um, is a quick, attribution license reuse allowed, meaning you can use this, you can share it um, if you want to, um, but you cannot um, modify it in any way or use bits of it, whatever you want to, but don't, you know, 
right? Make something new out of it. So, and maybe because this is what we're doing here is for educational purposes. We're not we're not a for profit organization making money off of these. There's no sponsors. There's no. I didn't pay you for this. No, no, no. <laughs> well, and, and, um, so. So we have that built in there for those specific. So yeah. and so that brings up those two points. One, it is the commission that has that right yes. to say we, we are not protecting these parts of copyright. These are yours. We, we open this up to the public domain for this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. So so we're talking about back to that very first. It's faceted, and it's the commission for these episodes because it's being done as work for hire. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, comic books, oh my goodness, there's so many lawsuits about who created what, what was actually work for hire, what was not. Mm -hmm. There are some places, especially creative realms, where in the employment contracts, it says anything you create belongs to the company, mm -hmm. right? They're being more explicit in those type of things on who owns what. Yeah, before you even start doing anything. Yeah. And, and even in academics, I don't know those of you from, from academics, when I was at UNL here in, uh, here in Lincoln at Nebraska, the faculty and administration were having a bit of a go around about who owned what mm -hmm. when they did their work on campus, the research and such. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were having those discussions. I'm not saying it was bad discussions. It was more like, okay, we need to revisit this. Uh, should the university claim some copyright with the work for hire, but with academic freedom, is the, the university going to waive that? We're going to do it case by case, all of those type of things. Okay. So that, that's copyright. I'm going to move on to something that people often think is copyright, and we've got just a little bit of time, but I think it's important. Absolutely. Trademarks. Mm -hmm. People get this confused with copyright. They are not the same thing. Trademark protects a brand or a logo, basically for marketing, and it is there to prevent similar products from using uh, another product's good name to create sales. So for example, let's say I make a really good widget, and my widget factory is called A Plus Widgets. Okay? Now, Krista is a rival widget company. Mm -hmm. So could she call her company A Plus Plus Widget Factory? Yeah. Probably not. Too close and it's too similar. Right. It would confuse the potential con um, consumer. Right. Potential, <coughs> potential exactly. customer. Now let's say Krista owns a book bookstore. <clears throat> Could she use A plus bookstore? Ah, that's where it gets. It's, it's separate products, so more than likely a trademark would be allowed in that mm -hmm. case. Yeah. It would most likely be allowed you think it's because it's a totally different business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are some companies, big companies, who have not agreed with that as, you know, oh, yeah. we make widgets, you're a bookstore. People are going to think, though, that your bookstore is our widget company. Yeah. In any, you know, logical sense, I don't so how, you know, people don't think you could confuse those things, but um, and, and sometimes they will. Um, actually, I, ju I just saw a thing that's related to this that came up. Um, Bumblebee? The Bumblebee that. case. I was just saw that. <laughs> yeah, you, go ahead and talk about that. Uh, um, okay, Bumblebee. There's various things. There's the bug. That's not what we're talking about, the insect. Mm -hmm. um, Bumblebee is a DC Comics character, um, a girl. Yes, an um, African-American African African -American superhero. Superhero with um, powers to sting and fly. Yep. They've been the, around since like the late 60s, early 70s. I think it was 77. 77? Okay. Bumblebee is also a transformer, a car. He turns from a robot into, depending on what time frame you're in, either a beetle bug, mm -hmm. a Volkswagen bug, or a, um, the, what's the new one? The, uh, I'm not, I can't remember what car it is in the yeah. new movies. But. And so he's also Bumblebee. The um, Transformers were in the early 80s, so a few years after the DC Comics book character. Yes. And just recently, Hasbro, who owns Transformers, is suing DC for the using Bumblebee because they think people will be confused. Or is it the other way around? Is DC suing? No, it's Hasbro going after DC. Hasbro is going after DC. Um, and in my brain, I'm like, eh? But... Yeah. But in some people's minds, they are both fictional characters. 
geared towards a certain age range. Right. And, and actually, it has to do with selling of the, of the um, action figures and toys. Exactly. That's the market that they are concerned about, that people will think um, um, somebody looking for Bumblebee the car will accidentally buy Bumblebee the African-American girl action figure. Yeah. And, and um, it, it, it does. It comes down to those auxiliary things. And that brings up another point. The trademark can be more than just a company. It can be an individual product. So we're talking about yes, characters. Hasbro is suing DC Comics over the Bumblebee name. Yes. Okay. So, and, and these are the things that happen. Um, and it's a trademark thing, yep. Yeah, and you, you've heard stories about daycares having to take Mickey Mouse characters off the walls. That was, and, I was hoping somebody would ask about that. That's been a class thing. Daycares or libraries using Disney characters in your displays and your, yeah. um, you know, somebody did a mural of all the kids' books. Awesome. And, yeah. That's a trademark issue, not copyright. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing why they are so, I, I don't want to use vicious, but so aggressive. In trademark law, if you don't protect that trademark, when it comes time to actually file a suit, that's meaningful. If you show a history of not protecting it, you will lose that lawsuit. And so you have to show that we've always made sure that this was ours. You are showing that it is still valuable to you. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know you get the church groups, the daycares getting these cease and desist from using characters mm -hmm. it's because if they don't protect their trademarks, if a rival company brought up you know Lucky Mouse that looks strangely like Mickey Mouse. Um, if they don't show that they're protecting that trademark, they're going to lose that case. Mm -hmm. So that's why. I'm not saying it's fair, but I'm saying that's why they do it. That's, that's the way the law is written for trademarks. That you've got to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, right. in something in the future, you're going to lose it. You know? And so because of that, there is no fair use exceptions in trademarks, except if we're talking about the product itself. So Would my, Bruce, please come down to first floor? So. Bruce, please come down the first floor. Thank you. Forget the interruption. So if I'm talking about the Husker football team, I can use the term Husker football. I do not have to revert to saying the college football athletics team from the largest university in Lincoln, Nebraska, because I'm talking about that team. However, I cannot put a Husker logo on a t-shirt and try to sell it without permission, without a license. So copyright and trademark are two different things. Copyright has fair use. Trademark does not. And trademark is usually more aggressively enforced. Okay. We've run long. Bumblebee um, was a Camaro. I knew I had to look okay. it up. Sorry. Any last I feel so bad. Okay. I'm, I'm going to lose my geek card. Your geek I, card. Um, no, that off the top of my head, yes. <laughs> uh, well, there's going to be a new spin off Bumblebee movie, too. So. I know, and they're going to change it again last night. And, and there's going to be a new Teen Titans series that has the Bumblebee cartoon. So both sides are. There's a lot of new things coming out, and that's probably why it's coming up now. With those characters. With both yeah. of those um, franchises, yeah. Okay. So we went over a ton, and we were really low on time. Any that's quick okay. Questions? We will answer any questions you may have okay. um, related to this. So go ahead and type in your questions. Was there anything you were wondering about? Um, why did you sign up for this session? Is there something that has happened at your library or your university that you wanted to clarify? Um, was it okay or not? Um, or is there something you're thinking about doing that you want to check and see if you think is something that should be done? Go ahead and use the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface and type it in there so we can answer it. Um, we did have a question that came in beforehand via email. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, let's talk um, about that one quick. That someone had sent it and they weren't able to be here today. So um, this is a public library here. on the Lincoln City Libraries wanted to know. Do you know if, um, what about taking images off the internet? This is something we struggle with for posters and flyers, etc. Um, we are on the side of caution, but I'm wondering if um, you know what is. What are the rules about that? What are the what do we need to think about when we're doing that? Well, here's here's where I, I'm at. If you don't know, assume it is copywritten and can't use it. That that's the safest method. That's an error on the side of caution. Right. Yeah. Um, now there are in, in Google and other places you could search for images and clip art that is free of of exactly, copyright. Yeah. Uh, or you can use it for nonprofit types of things. There's, so, there's um, search limiters you can put on for Creative Commons licensed yes. images so that you know that people, like I said, we did that to our videos. Um, some people putting images on the internet purposefully do say, yes, mine is available for anyone to use if you want to. 
and to cover yourself, limit your search that way to begin with, and then you know you're getting the ones that the actual creator has said it's okay. Yeah, so if you focus your search on those, you, you have a better chance. Um, but yeah, I, and I, also like off the top of your head, you know, don't use something off of a site like DeviantArt. Those are artists putting out their work. I mean, sometimes it's pretty obvious <laughs> that would not be something you would want to use. Um, the only case would be, is that artist coming to your library to do a program? Ah, they probably have something they will provide to you that is, here, promote my session using my work. Mm -hmm. You know, there's situation matters. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, and that brings up, there's whole questions on fan art. You know, it, the artist says it's okay, oh, yeah. but it's of a trademark character. Hmm, I don't know if I would even use that because they didn't get the trademark issue. Yes. Oh, yeah. Joel well, wants to know, um, so anyway, is there anything else about Jodine's question? Oh, to finish that off? yeah, I just, just randomly picking images off the internet is not a good thing to do. You're probably going to hit some copyright type of thing. And there have been some, some photographers, some artists who have made mm -hmm. those those suits, um, but there are places you can get, um, you know, license-free, royalty-free is often a good search, um, and like I said, use of the Creative Commons types of stuff, and there's more stuff going out there uh, in that area, so. And to really, really clarify, because this is still heard to my brain too many times, no. Putting it on the internet does not make it free and available to anyone to watch, to use. Yeah. Some people, some, I still do see that even in today, I'm sure there's somewhere on some Facebook group or some website saying, you put it on the, it's on the internet, it means I can use it. No, that is not how the world works. That's not how any of this works. Um, you, it, just because it's on the internet doesn't make it um, the, the it public domain. Yeah. That is not a thing. No, no, no. Yeah, unless the creator or copyright holder, and maybe not the creative, you know, the whoever, creator, owns the copyright. whoever owns the copyright has said this is public domain, right. or I'm given the creative comments for this use, assume yes. that it is owned. Yes. Now there's a big fight, and this is a whole other podcast about orphan works for books and stuff. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, this is a complicated area. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you have to take things case by case. That question about taking images off the internet, Assume that it is copywritten. Yeah, and um, purposefully look for things that are not, and yeah. there is there are ways to do that. So you do have there are plenty of options where you won't get yourself in trouble. Yeah. Just make that effort to begin with. Don't just randomly take anything just became up because it came up in your Google search. Yeah. Um, yeah. The only other comment we has is Mo wants to know if we're going to get the notes. Yes. You get the slides. Point. Yep, you'll get the slides with the. Um, um, afterwards with the recording. Yep. And uh, on the screen now, you'll see some links to where I got a bunch of my information. Uh, the middle one I do want to mention, it is an interactive exercise where if, you, if you're a classroom person and you have something in mind, it will ask you questions about what you're going to use this for and tell you if it if it's a classroom exception, if they think it might be fair to use. Nice. Uh, I, I tend not to do it um, in these sessions because it is question by question by question and it's for one case. You can't a particular use issue. You yeah. a particular thing that you're using for a particular purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, you'll get the slides, and so you'll have these links, yeah. um, and that's where I got a bunch of my information from, um, especially the Stanford site. It's really good mm -hmm. on the fair use bit. Good explanation. Yeah. Yep. And of course, the federal government, of course, has their info out there. Yeah. For you. All right. Anybody have any last minute, desperate, urgent questions you want to ask? Of Scott about um, fair use, copyright, anything. This is your last chance. <laughs> but of course, um, his email is on the first page as yes, well of his slides. Um, if you do have anything specific that you did want to ask his opinion on, um, I should be happy to answer you later. Uh, unless, you unless you're actively in a court case, in that case, oh, lawyer up. <laughs> yeah. I'm just yeah. saying, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I will not act as your lawyer. Um, you do not have a law degree. So. <laughs> no. So if you are actively in a case right now, lawyer up and don't make public comments. Mm, maybe that's why we're just calling. Yeah, that's it. Everyone's <laughs> under a lawsuit. No, no. All right. No. Well, it doesn't look like anything urgent has come in right now. That's fine. 
Um, thank you very much, Scott, for being on to share this. I know this was a session um, that you've done previously, and um, I haven't looked back because we didn't have the person who emailed the question and had asked if we had done this before. It had actually been a couple of years since we did anything on copyright. Oh, okay. That was like 2015, I think. So it's good to get an update on this um, kind of thing. Um, that was more of a copyright focus. This is going to fair use. As you said, there's so many things that are involved in this whole issue. Um, one hour can't cover everything, yeah. but with what we've got out there, bits and pieces, you know, different shows, we, you can put them together and maybe we'll do another update on something too. All right, so thank you, Scott, for attending. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to pop over here. Oh, these are the websites that he had. Um, the Stanford website, the um, exceptions the one to use to see if you want to, if you, um, what you are using is okay, and then copyright.gov. And this will all be included in the show notes afterwards as well. But I am going to go to our Encompass Live website. So that will wrap it up for today's show. The show is being recorded and will be on our website. Um, Encompass Live is linked right off to the Library Commission's website. But luckily, so far, we are the only thing called this in the world. You can see if you just Google Encompass Live, we come up as the only thing. Maybe you should trademark it. Oh, geez. Just kidding. I... <laughs> Just Not kidding. my job. I'll talk to somebody else. <laughs> um, so, and we are here at our main website here for the show, which has our upcoming shows and um, our archives are right over here. So, this is where you will see the archive we posted um, most likely later this afternoon, as long as YouTube cooperates with me. All of you who attended and registered for today's show will receive an email directly sent to you, and then will also be announced on our website and our um, mailing lists. Um, and here, last week's show, we had a list of the recording and the presentation. Um, this one's I'll probably have both of those and then those three websites that Scott linked um, mentioned as well listed here. So you have a quick jumps to those too. Cool. Um, we'll be all in here. Um, so that will be, um, oh no, somebody said, thank you all for the over. We missed the last 10 minutes to do a fire alarm. Oh my, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, hope you're okay there. You're back, yeah. Um, but we're all recorded here. So you can watch the rest of it um, when, when you're safe. <laughs> Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, I'll hopefully join us next week when our topic, um, we have a couple of things here on the calendar. I'm working on getting some things finalized. I know it looks like we've got nothing coming up, but things are being finalized for later in September and October. Next week's show is the new Public Library Director's Guidebook. This is a actually good for any public library. This is um, a handbook we've been working on for quite a few years here at the Commission. Um, uh, basics of if you are a new library director to public libraries, this specific to public libraries, or um, just moved into that position from other ones, this is going to be a good guide for you to what do I need to know to be a library director. Um, and there's, I believe there's some things that are Nebraska specific, but it's also um, like statutes and things, but just general guidelines yeah. about it. Yeah, being yeah. A library director as well. And um, this is actually created with um, some of our other um, library system directors. As I said, we have four systems here in Nebraska. Sharon Osenga is um, a co-director of our Central Plains Library System in the middle of the state. And Anika Ramirez is Three Rivers, which is in the northeast corner of the state. They will be with us um, next week. And Holly um, Duggan, who is our CE coordinator here, um, her predecessor at the commission started the whole was well, well in the beginning of the process. Well, there's been a guidebook for a while, but this recent revision, yes. Yeah, most there, recent yeah. revision. So um, we're going to be on next week. We'll show you it, we'll demo it, and talk about some of the parts in it. So if you are a new public library director, or even in a, I was going to say old public library director, <laughs> been in a job for a while, <laughs> it could have something of use to you as well. Yeah, it's good for anybody. Um, um, other shows will be added here. Um, also, just to remind everyone, um, on October 11th, this is um, Encompass Live is broadcast every Wednesday um, morning, except the week of our state library conference. Uh, Live Nebraska Library Association and School Librarians Association have an annual joint conference. This year, it is October 11th through 13th in um, Kearney, Nebraska. Um, so that is the one week of the year that we take off for Encompass Live. So um, just reminding people that we won't be on, but do um, make sure in Nebraska Library or you want to travel to Nebraska to visit to attend our conference. Our registration is still open till I think September twenty third. But don't wait. Register, register don't wait. Now. Register now. Yes. <laughs> um, so that will be um, what will be going on that week. We'll all be at conference. 
So other than that, that wraps up today's show. Um, and Compass Live is also one last thing on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, do pop over there and give us a like. Um, we post reminders of what shows that are coming up here. I did a reminder if you could log, people could log in on the fly for today's show. When the recordings are ready, we post on here. Um, there we go, the recording from the previous session. So um, do um, uh, give us a like and you'll get some notifications come up in your news feed from there. That's it. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Scott, for being here. Always a pleasure. We'll see you again sometime soon, I'm sure. We'll see you at conference. <laughs> yes, we'll see you all at conference in October. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye bye.